Well, I'm really thrilled to be here in the home of the great Vince Giordano, a legend in the jazz business. Um, and this is not only your house, but I consider it a museum mm -hmm. of memorabilia and music of uh, many decades of jazz, the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Of course, a time where a certain gentleman was the world's leader in the style of jazz, and that's Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. um, and just reflecting a little bit on his life, you know, he grew up without a father um, in a very poor neighborhood in New Orleans. And somehow he channeled so much inspiration and happiness through his instrument. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's been a goal of mine to try to channel that energy into my own instruments. And I've had you as an inspiration. Thank so you. it's an honor to be here. Oh, thank you. It's an honor to work with you and your brother and all you young fellows that are carrying on the tradition. So, so what is, uh, like, when you think about Louis Armstrong, what does he mean to you? Well, um, as the late Bob Wilbur once said, can you imagine what would have happened if Louis Armstrong, by some crazy reason, never got into music or never got jazz? What, what do you think would have happened to the evolution of jazz? And it's mm. really an interesting thought, and um, it makes me think because... Um, when Lewis started on his own uh, after leaving King Oliver, he just was trailblazing. And when he came to New York to play with Fletcher Henderson, not only was it crowded with people interested in hearing this new jazz phenomena, but there'd be lines of musicians that were there and saying, wow, what is going on here? There's something special. He was mm. a real pioneer and innovator that um, so many people were influenced by. Uh, you could really see it in the Henderson band. Uh, all of a sudden, that, that band, which was good, it was a good band, but it changed. Mm. It changed when Louis came. Right. People just had more intensity in their playing. And yeah. uh, a lot of people, you know, not only here in the States, but people like Django Reinhardt who would buy his records and, and listen. And so... He just uh, created music that changed the world. Mm. Yeah, well, I think of him as, you know, an improviser who was able to kind of make up melody on the spot. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way he kind of described it when he was asked about it is, he said, the first chorus, I play the melody. Mm -hmm. And then the second chorus, I routines the melody. And then the third chorus, I routines the routines. Uh -huh. So he was able to make up these new melodies, you know, with his scat singing, he made up new words mm -hmm. like uh, heebie-jeebies or skit dat de dat mm -hmm. So he was kind of a modernist in that way, I think. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, he was really composing on the spot. Mm. I mean, he didn't take a pen and paper and write it all out. It was just coming out of his mind and his heart and soul. Yeah, and, and you know, the audience, everyone out there who lives in New Jersey and, and New York, you know, we're so lucky to have uh, Louis Armstrong's house uh, intact, pretty much the way it was when he passed. Um, because Louis Armstrong was one of the world's most famous entertainers, but he lived in such an average neighborhood in Corona, Queens. Mm -hmm. And um, I know you and I have been to his house many times. I think we've played there together. Yes. But it's really cool to see that. It is, and I can't tell you how many people that I've brought there mm. that they, they said, well, show me something different. I said, I'll show you something different. Mm. And they just came out of there. It was, like, it was like a religious experience. It really was because that's how his impact is still coming, the energy. Mm. He's not there anymore, but he is. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Well, it's really an honor to perform today. We, we obviously have been playing some of the songs that Louis Armstrong uh, made popular because he he was a composer, but most of what he played was from the Great American Songbook. Mm -hmm. um, composers like Irving Berlin and Fats Waller and mm -hmm. some of these great compo American composers that we love so much. Yeah. Um, and I know you here have one of the biggest collections of sheet music mm -hmm. in the world, right? Yeah, I've got about uh, 60,000 published arrangements and about 40,000 or so, even more, uh, pieces of piano sheet music. So it's like 100,000 uh, 
you know, pieces of music here in this in this uh, complex, which is uh, overwhelming sometimes, but it's all organized, and every piece of music has its own little catalog number, and, mm. it, and it's in the database, so you can find anything within seconds. Cool. So, um, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about Louis Armstrong, but obviously you've been one of the you know, biggest uh, promoters of Armstrong's music. So, you know, what inspired you to do that? Or what, um, what first got you into jazz or Louis Armstrong? Well, uh, listening to old phonograph recordings, uh, when I was young in the 50s, all you really heard was AM pop radio music, like How Much Is This Doggy in the Window and Oh My Papa, real kind of saccharine stuff. I mean, mm. I'm, I'm happy for the people that recorded it and the composers, I'm sure they made a lot of money, but it, it really wasn't what I wanted to hear. And mm. my grandmother had this wind-up Victrola. It was her wedding present in the 20s. And um, I would sit there for hours and listen to recordings. She had a couple of Armstrong things and one King Oliver recording and uh, a lot of jazz and vaudeville that, that was popular in the 20s. And I just would sit at the edge of my chair with the feeling that I got off these old recordings. It, it, was, mm. it was a whole other language than what people were playing in the 50s. Mm. It was that raw energy. Right. Yeah, the way I like to think about Louis is kind of, he was one of the first great soloists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, before Armstrong, you'd have a band that would be great together, but Louis was able to kind of break outside of the band and be like the, one of the first great virtuosos. It's a little bit like if you have a good basketball team, that's great, but LeBron James, you know, he's out there on himself kind of wowing the audience. Yeah. And I think Armstrong was able to do that, so he toured the world with different bands, mm -hmm. and he was, he was able to be a star. Oh, absolutely. And I think being a New Orleans uh, musician, where they, where they not only strive to be great jazz musicians, but they also great to be, uh, they, they strive to be good entertainers, mm. to entertain the people. And uh, he had a wonderful combination, of course. His jazz was unsurpassed when people would just remark how he could just keep on coming up with different choruses and different choruses. His mind was just inexhaustible. He was like a, a, a well that just kept on flowing. Right, right. Cool. Well, I think uh, we'd like to go around your house and check out some of your Ooh. instruments. Uh, okay. We can see some here. Yeah. This is a, a bass saxophone. Yeah. Um, obviously, we have a tuba up yeah. there. And, you know, earlier when we were playing, uh, my brother and I were playing the different reed instruments. We were playing clarinet, mm -hmm. soprano sax, mm -hmm. alto sax, uh, tenor saxophone. Just a moment ago, I got to play a straight baritone, oh, yeah. uh, which is, I think, the only one in the world. I, as far as I know. So uh, I think we're going to have some fun in a few minutes checking okay. everything out. All right. Sounds great. 